recognize that it's the oldest book of the Bible. Now you say, well, how come doesn't it show up on page one? Well, the Bible is organized as three sets of books, historical, poetic, and then you've got the prophetic. And each one is chronological. But notice that Job is the first of the poetic books. And what we notice in the book of Job is there's textual clues that it dates back to the patriarchal era. Why? Because we notice that it's the patriarchs that are doing the sacrifices, not the priests. So this must predate the priestly era. And most scholars believe that because of the references to uh, the political system there and the economic system, that it dates back about five or six hundred years before Moses wrote the book of Genesis which means that Job would be a foundational book for Genesis. It's a foundational book for the rest of the Bible. Well, all these references to early history indicate that probably the book of Job was written in very ancient times. It's very likely the oldest book in the Bible, with the exception of the first few chapters of Genesis, Genesis 1 through 11. And as far as the author is concerned, I think it must have been Job himself. All the detailed conversations and so forth, if these really happened, and as they did, Job is a real person. He's confirmed as such in Ezekiel and also in James, the Old Testament, New Testament. And so nobody could really have recorded all this information except Job himself. And quite possibly, now this is not certain, but it seems to me quite possible that Job uh, handed this material down after he was restored from his trials, probably through his family, until possibly they came into the possession of Moses. And they were divided up into the tablets handed down by Adam and Noah and the sons of Noah and so forth, indicated by the foreign melodies of the generations of Noah and the generations of Isaac and so forth. These primeval tablets indicating the uh, history of mankind in the early years of life on earth, handed down from father to son through the line of the patriarchs, till finally they came into the possession of Moses, and he edited them and added his own interpretive comments, and finally that became the book of Genesis. Same thing, I think, possibly happened to Job, and I think it's significant that the ancient Jews all credited Moses with being the author of the book of Job. He was not really the author, I think Job was, but he was like he was the author of Genesis, the transcriber and editor, or at least this is very possible. And so what we have here is a picture of life in those very early years, soon after the great flood, earlier than the time of Moses, possibly even before Abraham, because although there are all these references to the early events of history, there are no references to the land of Israel, to the Ten Commandments, to Abraham, Isaac, or any of the Israel patriarchs. Evidently, Job lived in a different place and maybe an earlier time than these. So we have a very ancient book, and it does give us an insight into the life of the world in those ancient times. While many of those apologists who claim scientific accuracy in Job argue that the book was originally written even before the book of Genesis, Pick up three commentaries in the book of Job, and you will likely find three different proposed dates for its composition. Biblical scholars agree that no one can firmly date Job, and that it likely has a complex compositional history. Its setting, theme, and internal references lead some to conclude that the book of Job may indeed be the earliest book of the Bible, at least built from very ancient oral traditions, but others suggest it had a later compositional history. The earliest date given by scholars for the final writing of Job is the second half of the 8th century BCE, but most place its writing to have occurred in the late 6th or early 5th century BCE. While apologists largely assert Moses was responsible for the authorship of Job, who really authored the book, remains a mystery. No modern scholar of the biblical text believes Moses actually wrote any part of the Bible. Indeed, Moses is thought to have been a legendary figure, and not a historical person at all. What is certainly clear to anyone reading Job is that the prologue and epilogue are written as prose, while the dialogue in the center is poetry. This has led some scholars to speculate that while one author likely wrote the entire book of Job, two more ancient but different stories about Job were combined for the final product. The prose sections may have been an earlier folk tale, which was brought in by the author of the central section as a frame for his poetic dialogue. Alternatively, some have speculated that perhaps a later editor knitted together the prose and poetry, authored by different people at different times, into the whole we read today. 
By no means is this debate completely settled, and scholars still continue to argue over the overall compositional history of Job, as well as its details. Apologists rightly note that Job, and the rest of Scripture, is largely devoid of the usual mythological trappings found in other works of ancient Near Eastern literature. The earth is not said to be resting on the backs of turtles, for example, nor are the winds themselves gods, or the sea a deity worthy of worship. Apologists count this as evidence that Job, and the rest of the Bible, is far more scientifically grounded than these other works of mythology. But what else should one expect of literature produced by a monotheistic religion? Of course the earth does not rest on the backs of enormous turtles in a monotheistic religion, as a single god is all there is. Of course the winds and sea are not gods themselves in monotheism. What else should one expect? And yet, Job is just as superstitious as any of the other more mythological writings of the ancient Near East, in that such forces of nature like the wind and rain, features of the earth like the sea and mountains, are controlled by, or put in their place by, a single god, instead of a pantheon of deities. Indeed, the book of Job goes to great lengths to drive home the belief that God controls weather systems like rain and snow, and not that these are natural forces without any evidence of supernatural origin and control. Star clusters like the Pleiades stay bound together not because of gravity, but because God keeps them connected. Animal behavior is described as God-given, and not the result of millions of years of evolution. Such descriptions are not at all scientific. The forces of nature and the mysteries of the universe are explained merely by pointing to a god, which is the antithesis of science. But despite these primitive views in the book of Job, apologists who argue for its scientific accuracy clearly recognize the superiority of scientific thinking, because they contort the primitive passages of Job out of their native contexts into a foreign interpretation which they then use as evidence of the book's divine inspiration. These apologists are trying to bring Job up to the same respectable level as the scientific discoveries they pretend to find in these carefully selected biblical verses. By their practice, they are admitting scientific thought is magnitudes greater than religious revelation, but they are so committed to the worldview that they must force fit the Bible to be what it clearly is not. Before modern science, and for some still in spite of it, people would look at the world and explain features and mechanisms in it that they didn't understand in terms of agency. Agency is an inherent tendency for human beings to ascribe to natural phenomena an animate, conscious cause. When survival of our distant ancestors depended on avoiding predators, it was better for them to assume a lion or other conscious enemy was rustling the tall grass nearby and flee in the opposite direction than to assume the grass was moving merely because of the wind and stay put, or more dangerously, go into the grass to investigate. What once helped our fledgling species to survive continued to operate as human beings built small villages and then city-states, and it sometimes still causes us to see things today which are not really there. Oh, Matt, look at that. It looks like a face at the bottom right there with yeah. the eyebrows. Yeah. You see it? See the mouth? Yeah, you see yeah. it. Tell Sean Phillip. Sean Phillip. 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 You see the face? And the nose? Yeah, it done puffed out some. That's why. Oh, wait. The little. At the bottom. It would look just like a face a minute ago, Phillip, when Matt. I said, Matt, I see it. It's turning. I said, Phillip, look at that. I said, Matt, you see that face? Yeah. Not only have lions in the grass or leopards in the trees been invoked to explain some unknown event in the world around us, 
Some explanations of conscious agency involve supernatural beings instead. Supernatural agency has been invoked since time immemorial to explain the big questions puzzling humankind. Without any knowledge of superheated air caused by lightning, early people often attributed the sound of thunder to the voice of a god. Thor, Zeus, and Indra were all believed at one time to throw bolts of lightning while their voices reverberated across the heavens. As science progressed, however, many of those questions were answered with naturalistic explanations. The wind, for example, no longer needed gods assigned in the cardinal directions to move it over the Earth's surface nor did it require a god to give it weight. This evolved survival mechanism drove the authors of ancient religious literature, like Job, to ascribe agency to things like the movement of wind or the placement of the stars. However, there will always be questions, and so there will always be opportunity for some people to insert an agent, sometimes a god or gods, in place of human ignorance. Many people still believe the creaks and groans in an old house are caused not by the expansion and contraction of wooden frames and joints, but by disembodied but very conscious spirits. Get out. Children often explain oddly shaped shadows in their closets as belonging to boogeymen or monsters. But while Job's use of agency to explain certain phenomena by ascribing them to God may be more sophisticated than a child's use of agency to explain the shadow seen in her closet, it is only different by a matter of degree. Modern children can also provide us a glimpse into the thought processes of our pre-scientific ancestors, those minds which authored the biblical books like that of Job, ascribing to God what they could not understand. Richard Dawkins, an English ethologist, evolutionary biologist, author, and Ametrius Fellow of New College, Oxford, spoke with a child psychologist from Boston University regarding how children find agency and intelligently designed purpose in the world around them, particularly in objects which we know to have no such design, purpose, or agency associated with them. Dawkins himself is fascinated with how children start piecing together how the world works. Intrigued by a study on how children are naturally biased to believe certain kinds of ultimately religious explanations, Dawkins spoke with child psychologist Deborah Kellerman. Kellerman asked a series of questions to elementary school aged children to find out how they would spontaneously explain the origins of things. For example, Dr. Kellerman asked children why some rocks were pointy. She said there were a couple of answers to such a question that others had come up with, such as some rocks are pointy because little bits of stuff piled up on top of one another over a long time, while another person said rocks were pointy so that animals could scratch on them when they got itchy. Most children offered this question preferred the answer which proposed that rocks were pointy so that animals could scratch themselves upon them. Another question asked was, why are lakes still? She told the children, one person thought they were still and didn't have waves so animals could cool off in them without being washed away. Another person thought they were still and didn't have waves because no moving water ever ran into them. She would then ask the children which of those explanations made more sense to them. Invariably, most children preferred the answer that lakes were still so that animals could cool off in them. From Kellerman's research, it was discovered that children have a tendency, from about four years of age, to prefer or offer their own purpose-based explanations for the origins of things. Children do this around the same time that they learn artifacts, like chairs and pencils, have been made by someone for a purpose. This may orient the children toward an understanding that things are intentionally caused and intentionally designed. Once children understand that they are surrounded by such intentionally and intelligently designed objects, they apply that thinking to other things in their universe, like pointy rocks or still lakes. Job does not even remotely attempt to delve into the natural reasons or causes of phenomena like rain, snow, or lightning, but merely ascribes their causes to a supernatural agent, God. 
But is agency, as a placeholder for human ignorance, any reason to conclude such explanations are right? Is that good evidence for the supernatural or God? The limits of one's knowledge often evoke religious feelings. When Ptolemy, looking at the sky, could not conceive how the wandering planets moved across the heavens, he noted, I know that I am mortal by nature and ephemeral, but when I trace at my pleasure the windings to and fro of the heavenly bodies, I no longer touch earth with my feet. I stand in the presence of Zeus himself and take my fill of ambrosia. From his perspective, the movement of the planets were a mystery, only answered by appealing to the whims of a god. However, when Newton came along, he was able to explain the laws of motion and the role of gravity in keeping the planets in their individual orbits. He could explain how the planets moved across the heavens, and as such, there was no need to mention God. Newton discovered the answer, and God wasn't part of it. And yet, when trying to account for the solar system as a whole, what keeps the entire work together, even Newton reached the extremities of his magnificent knowledge. He too succumbed to feelings of religious awe in the face of his own ignorance. Newton stated, The six primary planets are revolved about the sun in circles concentric with the sun, and with motions directed toward the same parts, and almost in the same plane. This most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. And that is exactly what is happening in the book of Job. As the author listed all of the things about his world that were beyond his comprehension, the creation of the earth, weather patterns, movements of the stars, animal behavior, he, like Ptolemy, felt these mysteries belonged to the realm of God and thus assigned them to his sovereignty. And this is a trend that continues today. Creationists, not satisfied with the explanations of modern science, reject geology and evolution, and ascribe to God the creation of the world and its animals. More sophisticated apologists push the limits of their ignorance off a bit, and those, like William Lane Craig, allowing for an ancient earth built by natural forces in the processes of biological evolution for the origin of species, place God at the moment of the Big Bang, at the farthest reaches of their knowledge. Apologetic interpretations of the book of Job as a scientifically accurate document requires belief in a God, that this God inspired the texts to be written as we have them, and that this God cannot err. These are a series of assumptions that the apologists do not justify in their interpretations of Job, but instead justify by their interpretations of Job. Apologists front load their interpretations of the Jobin text with these assumptions and loosely read its passages so that they are forced into a modern scientific context. Their conclusion about the incredible scientific accuracy of Job is therefore inevitable. For these passages to be evidence of this God and his scientifically accurate inspiration of Job, the passages must independently be found to be scientifically accurate without the interference of the meddling apologist. The passages must support the belief, not the other way around. And since there is a reasonable alternative to the reading of the passages in their historical and cultural contexts, which does not support their scientific accuracy, then the passages are not evidence of inspiration by an omniscient God or evidence for the existence of this God. One of the ironies with apologists who claim amazing scientific accuracy in the biblical books, such as Job, is the actual denial of certain scientific facts in order to substantiate their argument. So for example, when apologists claim that Job is scientifically accurate in that it describes with incredible accuracy a dinosaur-like creature in chapter 40 of the book, they simultaneously must deny the scientific findings that separate human beings from dinosaurs by tens of millions of years. Human beings could not possibly have seen a living dinosaur and wrote about the creature some 4,500 to 6,000 years ago if the last of those animals went extinct 65 million years ago. 
But in order for the creatures mentioned in Job chapters 40 and 41 to have been dinosaurs living alongside the author of the text, such apologists need to reject the very science they claim was prefigured in the book of Job. So for these apologists, they can only accept science when it's convenient for them to do so. But as soon as science advances some sort of knowledge that they can't manipulate into an argument favorable to their reading of the Bible, it's rejected. And the same is true of the reading of the Bible. Apologists readily accept some of the most unscientific, literal interpretations of the Bible, including virgin births and resurrections from the dead. But when it is pointed out to them that Job 9.8 is referring to a solid canopy which ancient peoples believed covered the earth like an overturned teacup, they reject such a literal reading of the verse for a mysteriously metaphoric one, which instead references an expanding universe. In other words, apologists read the Bible and science textbooks for their own convenience. Both are manipulated and twisted in order to serve an apologetic need. If the many passages in Job describing the wind, rain, and stars are merely scientifically ignorant claims of supernatural agency, why do some apologists assert they are instead remarkable predictions of modern scientific discoveries? How can apologists confuse pre-scientific religious superstition with genuine scientific foresight? In many ways, reading back into Job evidence of modern scientific discoveries is like reading fulfilled prophecy back into the quatrains of Nostradamus. This shouldn't really come as much of a surprise, as apologists who promote the idea that Job hides evidence of remarkable scientific insight are the same apologists who claim fulfilled prophecy in the pages of the Old Testament, as well as hidden codes pointing to the coming of Jesus Christ in these same pages as well. Why do some people believe Nostradamus made accurate predictions regarding events in the 20th and 21st centuries, and others that the biblical book of Job contains statements of amazing scientific accuracy? Largely because they want to. Apologists make their bread and butter, arguing for the divine inspiration of the biblical text. In addition, they have an a priori belief in the existence of just such a being, supernaturally intelligent and powerful enough to have inspired the text of the Bible. What better evidence for such a being and its supernatural inspiration of the Bible than advanced scientific knowledge coded into the biblical text? It's not hard to find such evidence, if you're looking for it, have broad enough criteria into which such evidence can fit, need such evidence to support an a priori worldview, and feel your existence after death requires you to find such evidence. If guided by the apologists to read only those carefully selected passages they want read, separated from the larger and proper context of Job, carefully isolated to read only the interpretations the apologists want read, then of course the inevitable conclusion will be that the book of Job contains evidence of remarkable scientific insight. But it's fool's gold, bought at too high a price. Like that, the earth 
recycles water, you know it's not whack. It's all natural, it's not coincidental. Keeps the water clean, cause that's environmental. Rain, rain. The water cycle makes it rain, rain. Evaporation makes it rain, rain. Condensation makes it rain, rain. Peace, I'm out of here. Thank you.